<laughs> so we want to talk about being kind to yourself, but I'll give you a bit of background and a bit of perspective. First of all, how this idea came to me, uh, I did another podcast with a CEO, COO of the company that I work for, so a big group of vet practices, uh, Jody McKinnon. And Jody's a, she's a very high performing, very driven person, very efficient, effective person, and also expects a lot from the people in the company. And then when I did the interview with her, I asked her what's her biggest challenge in her role or what would she like to change? And she said, helping people to be kinder to themselves. And I immediately thought, mm, there's, there's an interesting one. And I immediately thought of you because I've seen you talk on this topic uh, really pow- in, in a really powerful way. And it is a big thing. It's a big thing in our profession. I don't know how much you know about the vet profession, Philip, but um, I feel like we're the perfect cohort for people who are going to be hard on themselves. And it starts at school already because you don't get into vet school without doing really well at school because you've got to get the marks. Yeah. So, there's, so there's an inherent sense of self-discipline and drive. And then it's vet school, university is really tough. It's, you don't get through university without, you don't do it by being soft on yourself, that's for sure. And yeah. and then yeah. work as well, the work environment, it almost it demands a, a high degree of conscientiousness and you know show up and do your stuff and sometimes shut up and don't whinge and get on with it because if you drop the ball, mistakes happen. If you drop the ball, you ditch the rest of the team and shit. So, you know, yeah, be kind to yourself, but but also <laughs> self-sacrifice is, so it gets rewarded in the, in the profession. But on the flip side, we also have massive rates of burnout, career attrition, dissatisfaction with the career. And in the extreme case, we actually have a, I don't know if you're aware of this, but four times the average suicide rate of any other profession. So clearly, we need to be kind to ourselves. But then that's the conundrum is how do you balance that? How do you how do you sit with those personality traits and how do you sit with the profession that demands these things of you? And how do you how do you gel that with kindness to yourself? So not not Good an question. easy not an easy thing to talk about. No, 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 it's not an easy one to talk about. And what I love to do is I talk. You know, that's why I love when I speak at, at events. I love going live one to one with people, not because I'm trying to be the hero, not because I'm trying to be different. I'm trying to be unique. Uh, most event organizers don't want you going one to one with the audience members because they don't want you to get a question you can't answer because it maybe makes them look bad. But mm. you get an opportunity to ask the question behind the question, so to speak. And and I, I want to be respectful to to the lady you cited. Uh, I don't want to necessarily dissect her life because we, she's not here and we I don't know. But I, I, my my number one piece of advice for her, anybody else who wants to help people be more kinder to themselves is you start at home. And it's not new advice necessarily in the context of, you know, life. But I think when, you know, you can either change something from a strategic intelligent level, like you can put a strategy in place or you can change it from the inside out. I worked with a client yesterday who said, I want to be nicer to my son. And I said, well, I can give you five tips, which I wouldn't, and I don't have them. But I said to him, I have five tips to give you that you can do today that will will show some results, or we can change how you feel about yourself and therefore how you communicate from the inside out to your son. So you don't have to worry about strategies and tips and everything else. You tell me which one you want. And thankfully, he went for the, the deeper you know, dialogue and narrative and so on. And we got into some really, really powerful territory. But that lady, most people who are hugely driven, massively innately driven, they're cruel to themselves. They're they're not just not kind. They're actually cruel to themselves. Mainly people who do Iron Man or Iron Women, whatever the political correctness is around that, is there is a type of um, punishment that they go through physically, mentally and emotionally. So it's not all about achievement and, and, and moving forward as a human. There is a really dark side to people who are driven. And the challenge, and I'll finish with this, is when you lean in, and and that's my work, when you lean in to begin to not take that edge away, that harshness, that drive away, but when you begin to invite people to soften it, they grab tighter and they, don't you take my story, don't you take my identity, don't you take my harshness, my drive, because look where it's got me. It may not be perfect, but look what, so it's become part of their identity. And what I see with people is when they start to soften around the edges, when they become kinder to themselves, they don't lose their focus. In fact, if anything, their focus becomes laser. They start to do nothing other than what they want to do in the world. 
that is the only result that I've ever seen in that regard. But I'll leave it there because the, obviously there's a broader conversation that we're going to get into. Yeah, it's a good question because that, that was exactly the question. It is that fear of, but I do so well with with the way I do it. I drive myself. When I look at you, you you've, you've achieved. You're an achiever. You're a, an ambitious person. Yeah. But you talk a lot about being kind to yourself. I, I still, and I, I hopefully we'll get to how, how do you do that? How, how do you take away the goal orientatedness without that? Get out of bed, you fat, lazy slob, and go for that drive. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> is there a different way? <laughs> well, I think I think I think you you've 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 kind of nailed the societal perspective that it's one extreme or the other. That you know, I said to an entrepreneur once, and I have a lot of entrepreneurs exit businesses, not in the mechanics and the numbers, but in the emotional landscape. Like, in other words, like you know, how do I dismantle this? I, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs who try to screw up a sale of a business simply because they don't want the sale of a business because they don't know who they are without it, and they don't know who they're going to be beyond it. And what's interesting is helping them just navigate emotionally, and mentally, to the place of letting go of the business so it doesn't define them anymore. And and, and the veterinary world is is ripe with this. It is not just are you. Have you built an identity around yourself? You're, 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 you've built an identity around yourself in a society that applauds you. I mean, one of my closest friends growing up was a guy called Finbar Heslon, who's a vet in a, a little town called Salbridge in County Kildare. And Finbar is well, very well known in the, in the veterinary community in Europe and not just in Ireland, but in Europe. But I always remember going away for weekends to these adventure places and going kayaking or whatever. And you'd walk into a bar. And I did feel inadequate many days where you'd say, what do you do? I'm in sales. What do you do, Finbar? I says, uh, I'm a vet. Oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> what kind of animals do you specialize in? And suddenly I may as well not have been there. So I, I wouldn't probably be on me if I actually said on occasion, oh, I'm a vet as well, like just to try to get some attention from people. But it, suddenly he was elevated Mm -hmm. by all these people around him. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing worse than feeling dejected around your life when you've gotten to a point that society says you're at the pinnacle. In other words, what I'm saying is it's very difficult for men and women to admit they're unhappy when they've got their children, when they've got the lovely house, when they've got the job, they've got the few euros Mm -hmm. or dollars or whatever in the bank. Society is telling them they, they've, they've, they've won the lottery on every fundamental level. And it's almost you've no right to even complain. And I feel that that is a hugely prevalent problem within the veterinary community. Not because I'm in, 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 you know, working with them on a daily basis, but I know a number of vets and I've seen that. It's very difficult for them to even have the right to admit that they're not happy. And I think that's one of the challenges they they. they they, they, they button their mouth, they, they live with it, they're told they should be happy because of what they've achieved. It doesn't quite mark, meet the mark, and therefore it, it, it's more difficult for them to open up around the, 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 the discipline. And, and professional soccer players, I work with quite a few, the same principle there. They get to play a sport and get very well paid for it. And they feel guilty about sometimes saying, but I'm not happy. Yeah, which I can understand. So is it going to be too much of a detour to say, how do you find the source of that unhappiness? Or is that, is that a massive topic? And should I, should I bring us back no. to? I, and I think, I, I think you go back to the beginning. Why, why did you go into the practice in the beginning? Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a question I often ask soccer players or professional athletes in that is, who do you play for? And they go, they name their team. And I go, no, 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 no. Who do you play the game for? And they just don't know what to say. They don't know where to look. And they'll sometimes say, oh, well, I play for myself. And I go, really? And I'll ask them a couple of questions. And that turns out not to be quite true. And often, and I'll give you a quick example rather than speaking obscurely. Mm-hmm. I was working with a, with a team and, and it was a preseason camp. And the, the big goalkeeper came over to me and he says, uh, have you got a minute? I said, of course. I mean, just walk down the beach. And I said, uh, so what do you want to chat about? And he said, why is it that I'm getting increasingly more scared of making mistakes. I said, okay, so walk me through it. And I said, you, is it anybody in particular you're afraid to make a mistake in front of? He goes, oh God, no, no, there's nobody in particular. And I know you're probably going to pull the dad or the mom card, but it's, it's nothing to do with that. I said, okay, cool, brilliant. I said, let me, let's just play, play a scenario here. Let's just, and we're literally walking down the beach. And I said, it's a, it's a, it's a blustery, windy day. And you're playing in a stadium that doesn't have, you know, cover, a lot of coverage. So the wind is coming through the pitch. And uh, it's zero zero. You got a minute or two to play in the game. There's a free kick. 
the ball is curled into the box. You jump up, you feel confident that you've, you've gauged your timing correctly. But as you reach up into the air, you suddenly realize the ball is going to pass you. You've, you've jumped, your timing is off, the wind has taken the ball, whatever. And you, by the time you hit the ground, you hear the crowd screaming because the guy behind you, the opposition, the enemy, whatever you want to call them, have just scored in your goal. And you've screwed up, basically. And as you pick your face off the dirt and you look into the crowd, who's the one face you do not want to see? And excuse my language in, in advance. I typically don't apologize for it. He goes, oh, fuck you, he said. And I said, go on. And he said, it's my dad. Yeah. This is a grown ass man. That, and I don't mean that in a judgmental way, mm. who is completely unaware that at the ripe old age of 31 or 32, as he matures into his career and is beginning to come towards the end, he's still playing the game. He's still playing literally the game of chase in looking for approval of his father. And I think on a very basic level, if your listeners could just stop and ask themselves, who did they do this for? Who did they start doing it for? What are they trying to achieve? Not, not the noise, not the stuff below. Go. There's a question behind the question. There's always a question behind that. And I think if you can reconcile that one, I think you have an opportunity to own what you do and do it the way you want to do. Because you did say earlier on, and I don't disagree, but I do disagree, that it's a, it's, it's, it's a career or it's a path that demands from you. So there's lots of demands in my time. It doesn't mean I say yes. It's a choice. And you can't choose to say yes or no to demands when you're playing for somebody else. But if you're playing for yourself, it's a very different animal. It took me 40 something years to try to figure that out. I used to think I was here to help all these other people. And I am here to do that, but not to the detriment of my own soul. So in your experience, the, the lack of kindness to yourself, the, the, is it normally the, the parent thing? Where, where, where does it? Where's the wound? Where does the wound mostly come from? Because I, I, I look at myself and I, I can say hand on heart, but I don't know, maybe I haven't gone deep enough. But, but I certainly never felt excessive judgment or harshness or anything from my parents. I had a, I had brothers, they might have been a different story. <laughs> but, but when I'm harsh with myself, I don't ever hear the voice of my dad or my mom. Mm. And, 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 and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't want to come across that, that, that the source of it is always your parents, mm. but your parents influence it. Mm, and your okay. parents influence it by not just by what they say, but what they don't say. Okay. So I literally was working with a man last week and, 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 and I said to him, I said, tell me about your childhood. It's the starting point. When I do private work, I just always start with the first session is I just want to understand your story. And therefore, I want you to begin to understand the narrative, all the things you've been through that have formed who you are today, that don't have to determine who you're going to be tomorrow. And they do, unless we're aware of them. And he said, really happy childhood. And I said, well, I've heard that one before. And, and I said, according to who? And he said, well, according to me. And I said, well, in that case, you won't mind if I ask you a few questions. And he was very, quite defensive. And, and when we got to some moments of, let's just call them maybe weaknesses in his, in, in, in his parents' parenting style, he would justify and rationalize it by, but my dad just did the best he could, which I understand he did. And it was a societal thing back then or whatever. And, and while both of those things are true, both of those things blind us from what actually was going on. And yesterday, I think we had a, we had a follow-up call and, I, and, and the, the conversation of shame came up. And he goes, I don't really have a relationship with shame. I said, when, when, you, when you begin to connect with it, when was the first time you felt shame? And he said, I was six or seven years old. I stole something from a shop. I showed it to my parents because I felt so guilty. They insisted on me going back to the shop, walking up to the shop owner and telling him what I had done, paying for the item, leaving it behind, whatever. Mm. Now, forget about whether the parents did the right thing or not. That's not the point. The point is from that moment forth, he would feel immense shame when he did anything wrong in his life, it became part of his narrative, part of his identity. And I'm working with a young man who until very recently would have said I was cuckoo. I was out there. I was wacko. I was nuts. When I said to him, I said, you just don't really like who you are as a person. 
this is nothing to do with your industry. This is nothing to do with this. It's nothing to do with the guy who just screws you over in a business deal. You just don't like who you are. And therefore, you give yourself what you feel you deserve. You have all the vision boards and all the goal setting. But really, it amounts to nothing because if you don't like who you are at the core and you walk through this earth, you will find ways to give yourself what you feel you ultimately deserve. And I know we're getting into very deep territory. I believe very rich territory, but very deep territory. Most human beings I work with don't really like who they are. And if you don't like who you are, there's probably no better profession to go into to try to write that than being a vet, being a doctor, maybe being a dentist. And my, my limited understanding of all of those professions, and I've worked with people from those professions, many of those professions have the same challenges that you outlined at the very beginning of this call. Disconnectedness within the industry, attrition, suicide, depression, alcohol, drug abuse, all these different things. There's a reason for that. No matter how much giving you give, no matter how much, even down to the last drop of blood that you give to your clients, it's never going to make up for the disdain, the dislike, the distrust that we have within our souls towards ourselves. And I can feel that so heavily because not just do I see it every day, I can feel it in my own story because as much as I'd love to play the hero here and and be seen as the guy who's dedicated his entire existence to helping people, it's true. Mm. But there's also a deep selfishness to that because I was trying to make up for, for my own gaps, my own holes, my own inadequacies, my own shame. So I think when people say I I do it for the love of animals, I do it for the love of people, whatever the story is, I I know that's partially true. Mm -hmm. But there's also something that drew you there, whether it's following in your parents' footsteps, whether it's trying to impress somebody, whether it's societal pressure. But I also think there's a sense of selfishness is not the right word, but I'm going to use it because I can't find a better one right now. But there is a a selfishness about why we're doing what we're doing, but most of us are not in touch with it. We're not honest about it. Is it a case of wanting to be the hero in your story? So there's, yeah. a, there's an inadequacy or something that you feel and you go, how can I how can I prove to the world and therefore to myself that I'm the hero of this story? Does that yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, and I'm a good I'm a good person. Yeah. And yet the cruelness, and, and, you, and you've got to be quite astute with your listening and, and more importantly, hearing. You know, what I do is I don't listen to people. I, I hear them. At least I try my best to hear them. And it's not even what they're saying to me because most people are trying to say something and they're trying to convince themselves. And sometimes they even get past the first layer of my spidey senses. And then sometimes I find myself going, do you, do, have, you have you heard how you speak about yourself? Do you, do you know how you hold yourself in the world? And if you listen really, really carefully, you'll find that that disdain, that dislike, that distrust that comes out in people is there and it's embedded. And therefore, a lot of what they do on the outside is to try to compensate for that. And the reality is they need to shine a light inside and look at their lives, look at who they are, look at what they've done, look at what's been done to them and to reconcile that and be at peace with that and then therefore be at peace with themselves and then be at peace in whatever they do as a profession in the world. So how does that manifest? So let's say somebody's listening, maybe not me, uh, and thinking, no, no, I don't, I don't think so. No, I, I don't think that's me. Because we're very good at, at creating that story to the point where, and, and especially vets, we're very clever and can, can reason our way through things and and very good at lying to to ourselves probably what does it what does that disdain how does it manifest how do you recognize it as oh shit yeah maybe maybe philip's onto something there well i, I mean disdain sounds like a very harsh yeah. very okay. big word yeah. so uh, you know i want to just name that out loud that it may not they may not be in touch with the disdain and and, and you cited something you know uh, not just have people who have gone through veterinary school had to be hugely um disciplined and 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 ter- like just turned on and and it, it, you know really really intellectually engaged to get through the the level of schooling they have to go through to be qualified as as a vet ultimately therefore they are getting a a societal reward not just in a piece of paper but literally a profession 
for being intellectual. Therefore, it's very, very difficult to begin to turn that down, never mind turn it off and get in touch with what we're talking about, because this is not intellectual necessarily. This is more in the feeling space, the call it the woo-woo space, which is a nice way of saying it's bullshit, but, but essentially it's more in the emotional space. And if you find yourself at a movie, which I did many years ago, Lassie 25 or, you know, whatever, some actor dies or whatever, and you find yourself crying a little bit disproportionately to what's actually going on in the movie, it's probably nothing to do with the movie because the actor dog is, is still alive and we all know, or the actor that jumped off a cliff or was pushed off a cliff is still alive. Um, but you find yourself just being kind of oddly emotional at these obscure times. And you cry, what you're doing, what what that tells you, there's a lot of emotion that you're simply not processing and you haven't given yourself the time. The other one I see is the expectations you you alluded to at the very beginning of the call with with somebody else. But when you have high expectations on others, it's it's a direct reflection of the expectations you have on yourself. And that drive, we don't want to take it all away. But the reason you're being you're pushing yourself so hard is the fact that no matter what you do is never enough. That's another indicator that there's a harshness that you hold upon yourself in the world. And it's always going to be the next mountain, the next hill, the next achievement, the next goal. It's always going to be that thing. And the way I often talk about it is you get to the top of the mountain and you look across and, well, first of all, you stop for a brief second and go, shit, I thought it'd feel different. I thought when I got my veterinary practice up and running, this was the dream. I'm in Brisbane. I'm in a busy neighborhood. I've got my lease. I put my little sign over the door. I have my first client. Well, I, I thought it would feel different. What if, what's wrong? Oh, I, I get it. I didn't open one in Adelaide. And then the, the, and then the one in Sydney, it, it's the chain I have. What was I thinking? Of course, it's the chain. And all the rationale that goes with it, growing for growth's sake. And then when you open the chain, then it's like, well, well what's missing? Well, I've always loved, I've always wanted a coffee shop. But let's, well, why don't I, with the profits from the business, assuming I have some, I'll, I'll open a cup. And then, it, well, but, but why am I feeling the connection? Well, maybe it's, my, maybe it's my husband. Maybe I'm just sick of him. Maybe I need to upgrade him or her or whatever. And it just never, ever stops. And hopefully before we die, we look in the mirror one day and we go, I think the problem is just internal. And it's not even that big a problem necessarily. But what I'm talking about is actually very simple. It's not easy to do, but it's really simple work. I think we put a lot more complexity on it and people go, well, that works hard. And I go, it is not harder than not doing it. I can guarantee you that. So what does the work look like? The most important work I think any human being can do. In fact, I would go as far as to say, I feel we have a moral obligation to do this work. If we choose to leave the couch, leave our bedroom and walk out into the world and interact with human beings, We have a moral obligation to do the work on ourselves so that we can show up as a better human every single day. If we choose to bring children into this world or can bring children into this world, we have a moral obligation to work on ourselves so we don't pass our bullshit, our stuff, our subtleties. It's not all bullshit. These little subtleties, these nuances onto the next generation. Typically, what we do as humans is we either repeat history and do what our parents did or we do the absolute opposite to prove that I'm not like my dad. Neither of those is an organic Uh, authentic reflection of you as a man or a woman in the world. It's like finding your own gauge. Who are you at the core? The most important work I think any human being could do on a very basic level is just go to a therapist. Obviously, I'm going to say everyone should come to me, but that's that's not what this is about. This is about trying to get people to realize that actually, even if they had the perfect childhood, which doesn't exist, it was so perfect that they've got problems from it. Uh, I, as I say to people, like the best parenting advice ever that I can give any human being, no matter what you do with your kids, you're going to fuck them up. And what I mean by that is it doesn't mean you give up on them. If you hug them too much, they're going to need therapy. If you don't hug them at all, they're going to need therapy. And it, what I mean by that is you, you, you just give yourself a break. You don't have to be perfect. That's another issue, by the way, for a lot of veterinary uh, uh, or people in the veterinary world is they give so much to their career And if they have kids or partners or wives or husbands, as they often feel they're giving 50% to them or 50% and they're caught in this never ending uh, cycle Mm -hmm. and vortex of I'm not really winning anywhere in my life, which is exhausting, Mm -hmm. like absolutely one of the most exhausting things in the world. Um, Go back into your childhood. 
There is no man or woman on this earth that if they go back in and they're guided in a beautifully compassionate, strong, challenging environment, they will not uncover things about themselves that will blow their mind open. And understanding, therefore, and this is the key, understanding how the past has influenced who you are today around money. God, we've got such a screwed up perspective of money. Like, oh my God, it's a staggering. You and I could talk for four hours just on money. And veterinary, uh, the veterinary practice does not get off that card either. They don't get a, a grade. They don't get a pass there. Um, if you're in a room of 20 people and you say one word that, that, that captures honestly how you feel about money, you will have freedom, anger, disdain, love, hate, whatever. You'll have every word in the spectrum. And every one of them have a positivity and a, and a shadow side. And it's not right or wrong. It's just being aware of it. If, it's, if, it's, if the word is freedom, and go, well, that's the best word because that's the cool word. They go, yes, yeah, so you need money to be free. Oh, I didn't think about it like that. Because then what's enough and enough? So, so going into your past and understanding how your past has influenced your present. And I guarantee you'll see where the harshness comes from and why you're not kind to yourself. But I want, I want to share one little story because I, I think this kind thing... And I really commend you for bringing this conversation to the table. Like when, when I read what this conversation was going to be about, I, I kind of smiled and I said, fair play to this guy in a world of such intellect and such headiness. And I say that with, with respect to bring a conversation in around kindness that requires courage. That requires somebody with, with a vision. And I, and I'm not just saying that to be nice. I really mean that, but, but, but we, what does it what does it even look like or sound like? And I know you've asked that question. I've given a couple of examples. And, and I think ultimately it's this, no matter what I do, it's never enough. But the challenge for many people, entrepreneurs and driven people is they don't know that when they're in the middle of it. But there was one story that I'll always remember. And this was a well-known man who was, you know, was on TV and different stuff for like that. And he came to a workshop and he sat there very passively. And many people who are well-known in society don't want to come to group work with me. They want to work with me privately because they don't want the world to see that they've got laundry too. And maybe it doesn't smell as good as they want everyone to believe it does. <laughs> and this man was sitting there and I looked at him and I called him John. I say, John, what's going on? He goes, oh, this is great. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just observing. I said, no, I know you are. Any questions? And he goes, yeah. When, when someone, he said, when someone does, and I said, no, no, you can stop right there. We don't do <laughs> just this. Just asking for a friend, is he? <laughs> exactly. I said, we don't do that. I said, I want you to make it personal. And he says, okay, well, why, why, no matter what I start, I never quite finish. What's the answer? Why, why, why do I do that? And I said, well, it's a pretty big question. And, you know, I need to probably begin to understand a little bit more about you. And he goes, okay, ask me any question you want. I said, well, tell me what it was like to grow up. And he said, well, you know, the deal, black kid, white neighborhood. And I stopped him right there. And I said, no, I'm a white kid. And <laughs> I was in a very white neighborhood. I don't know what it was like. And thankfully, I stopped him. And he said, well, it was really bad. And I said, tell me about how bad it was. And then he started to tell me how bad it was. And I said, what was, the, what was the most pivotal thing that you had to do in order to survive or fit in, or at least to attempt to? And he said, I had to put white powder on my face. He, that's what he chose to do to fit in. That's how much we want to fit in a society. And, I, and like I, I've told the story a few times over the last number of years. And I, even I, when, I, when I connect with it today, I feel like I could just burst into tears because my heart was broken for this man in this room. And I could just, and I said, how old were you? And he said, I was about 12, 10 to 12. And he said, I would put white powder on my face to try to you know, make myself less, look less black, essentially. And I'm standing there trying to keep it together, but being comfortable enough in my own skin to allow the emotion to be shown. Everyone's tear, everyone's crying. There's tears rolling down my face. And what I noticed was the disdain and the judgment that he had towards the white powder. And I did something in that workshop that I'd never done before. And I took a chair into the middle of the room and I said, I want you to look at that, that chair and I want you to imagine that 10-year-old, your, yourself, that little 10-year-old boy. 
with the white powder on his face. Now I knew I knew what was coming. I just didn't know the extent of what was about to be unleashed. And I want you to say something to him. Mm. And he looked at the chair and he said, "You weak piece of shit. Be a man. Grow ball. Whatever these mm. horrific, horrific, violent statements." And when he finally stopped abusing, ultimately of himself, essentially, is what we're talking about here. I looked at him and I said, the not finishing is not your problem. Never has, never will be. But until you get to a point that you can look at that chair and the only thing you want to do is pick up that child and hug him and hold him, and tell him he's okay and that he's doing his best, you're never going to be happy. You're never going to be fulfilled. You're always going to be searching for something that you will never, ever find. That is powerful. And we do that, don't we? We put the white powder on or whatever, the, yeah. whatever you're trying to hide. <laughs> It was staggering. And I, I, I did not, obviously, you can, I'm not looking at notes. I had no plan in sharing that story today, but it just, it just came up and it just felt so relevant because of the energy you're creating and the conversation we're having. And it might sound extreme to some, but we all have that version of it within ourselves. We all have that inner bully. And, and it's not about getting rid of the inner bully. It's about naming it, understanding where it comes from and allowing that voice just to soften. And when I say Often, it, that's the epitome of the absolute opposite of what so many in your profession are and have been and have become. And, and I say become. They, did, they weren't born like that. They became that. They, in a cultural context, in a societal context, in a family context, they became the, this, this, this driven. And what I'm saying to you and to them, if they're still listening and they're still tuned in and they haven't checked out and said, this guy's totally cuckoo, is that by by softening around the edges, you become a better human. You will become, I believe, five times the veterinarian that you are. But you'll actually be happier and you'll be more fulfilled and you'll be less driven by audacious goals. And you'll allow yourself to live from a slightly more organic, intuitive place where you just, things show up and you meander a little bit more in life. And I don't mean that in an unorganized way. You just, things present themselves to you. You know, the most unattractive guy or girl at the bar is the one that bursts through the door trying to find a date for the night or a wife for, the, for life or a husband for life. But when you're not looking for a relationship, you're not desperate, you haven't put on a vision board and you haven't written a goal and you're not going around measuring people saying, oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're the right height. You, you fit my vision board. You're perfect. That, that's the place I think we need to get back to in life. And you can't get there unless you're nice to yourself. We used to call that dating thing this, this thing. Somebody has this stink of desperation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can't walking around with a stink. Can I bring up one other thing as well? Absolutely. And we, we don't have to go here necessarily. I trust you 100% on this. But this, this idea that when you become a vet or when you become a vet and you own your own practice or when you become a vet and you're working with the right company, fill in the blank, whatever the thing is. It's almost seen like often interpreted or seen like a finish line. That when I get here, then, okay, it's, it's, it's going to be okay. One of the things that I suspect will resonate with you, if not many of your listeners, is the absence, and here's a great indicator to know if someone's kind to themselves. What is it that you do or what is it that you used to do that you love that you've stopped doing? And they'll say something along those well, I mean, I used to surf, I used to sail, I used to fish, I used to paint, I used to write poetry, I used to fill in, I used to watch movies. And what you'll find is many of your audience members have given those things up in the hope that they'll come back to them someday. But Philip, hang on, we've got a practice in, in Adelaide, remember, we've got one in Sydney, the new one, and it's, it's hopping. We've got the one in Brisbane, right? We're thinking Cairns next, where we might go across to Perth. Actually, we might go to New Zealand. Who knows? We might go global. When I sell that, Philip, when I sell that, I'll write all the poetry. 
that most poets combine never had a chance to write. I'll paint all the paintings, I'll do all the surfing. And life doesn't work like that because when you abandon yourself, and I'm using that language very intentionally, when you abandon your artistry, which is a form of abandoning self, you don't just pick it up and go back to a place without a form of regret or disconnectedness to it. So what you'll find is how many people have given up something they've loved in the pursuit. Now, I appreciate maybe during exam times and particularly intense times. I get it. And the other side of this as well is, yeah, but, 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 but it doesn't, surfing doesn't help my business. Poetry doesn't help the, the margins. And I would respectfully say that is complete and utter horseshit. Because what it does is it supports you. And I can tell you if someone's being burned out, maybe they're in the wrong profession, maybe they're doing it for the wrong person, maybe they haven't done it for themselves, fill in the blank. Maybe they don't like who they are. So no matter how, if they give and give and give every last drop of blood, then they will be enough. Or maybe they've also stopped doing something that brings them joy, that energizes them, that, that fills them back up again so they can come back out into the world and be a better human being every time. And I've noticed this pattern with, with driven people is they give up their artistry. They give up fun in the pursuit of career. And it is a catastrophic mistake. You totally, totally hit the nail on the head there. Because again, it's a, as a rule, it's a wide, broadly talented group of people. And it, it, it starts at university. It starts at vet school. You don't have time for the, for the art for the singing in the choir, for the music making, for the for the stuff that fills your soul, really. It becomes, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, when I qualify, once I finish final exams, I'll do it. And exactly as you say, you you generally don't. You generally don't. That's a, that's very good advice. Yeah, yeah, you hit many nails. I want to circle back to, to what you said about the, the, the phenomenon of being spread thin, of... I'm not a good enough vet because I've got kids and I've got, and again, we, we are predominantly a female profession where culturally the, they're still the mom, it's still the primary caregiver, but they're also the yeah. vet and now they're also earning practices and they just feel inadequate at all of those. What, what do you do about that? Is it just a case of just giving yourself a break, lowering your expectations or how do you, how do you handle that? Give, you, give your kids away. <laughs> and, and, I, and I say that tongue in cheek and I say that jokingly, but like, that's where people go. They go, well, I can't give my kids away. And I've invested so much into my career. Like we're, we're not talking, I mean, and correct me, I'm wrong. Vet school is not like 12 months oh, yeah. and a couple of hours a day. I mean, it is years. And, and one of the challenges when you get, we work with people who sometimes realize that maybe they need to reimagine their career or their relationship with their career or their positioning within their career is that they go, well, I've invested so much. Mm -hmm. I've invested so much. I can't just go down to two days a week. I can't, you know, sell the practice and just do one day or, or whatever it is. Or they've built a lifestyle that, that requires them to have to work, which is by the way, very convenient because that's, a, and I, and I say that very sarcastically and, and thankfully you're from a place that understands sarcasm. <laughs> um, but uh, sometimes we create a, 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 a machine that requires us to be a workaholic. And I believe, and this, this may not go down very well with your listeners and, and so be it, but workaholism is not a, 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 an addiction to work. You know, I don't think entrepreneurs are driven people, vet or, vets or otherwise, you know, love the office. I often think it's, they just don't know how to be at home. And one of, one of the, one tragedy that that emerges is that we justify that we're doing it for our family this conversation that i work with a lot of business owners and and, and i know this will resonate with with you or with others if we allow it to if we're honest with ourselves and that is you know i often meet people go yeah but i mean i mean look i mean my kids are gonna have a great lifestyle when i eventually sell this business or build it to a certain point i just go have you, have you just explained the landscape to them and they go well what do you mean have you ever sat your kids down and say, just so you understand the reason or excuse I use, and I, I, I often bring excuse in for being a workaholic is I'm doing it for you. Now, when I'm not at your soccer game, or if I'm at your soccer game, but you know, I'm not present because I'm either on my phone or I'm, I'm still in the practice. 
but you know I'm not really there, okay? You know and I know. We all know, so let's stop bullshitting. When you know that that's happening, you're okay with me doing that because you know I'm building the practice for you. And it's, a, it's, a, it's such a good excuse, isn't it? It's a, it's a brilliant excuse. And I say it with love and respect because I'm, I'm guilty as hell of doing this myself. So I'm not sitting here preaching and telling you this is, I, I do not want to come across the guy as a figure it all out. Because all I do is get my wife and my kids in and I'll give you 55 <laughs> reasons why I'm a shitty dad just in the last 24 hours, never mind in life. But, but I say, okay, well, all I ask you to do is to let your kids know that that's what you're doing or at least give them a choice because I have yet to meet an adult that looks me in the eye from a place of absolute honesty and goes, I wish my mom and dad worked harder, maybe smarter. That's a different conversation, but I can tell you the world is littered with people who wished their dad saw them, heard them, loved them unconditionally, hugged them, told them they were proud of him or her for whatever they did or, you know, not, not anything they did, but for we, these once in their life, so we often tell ourselves these stories, but the more I look at it, the more honest I am with myself and, and, and the people that I serve is workaholism is, 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 an, is an awkwardness of, 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 of connection. It's, 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 it's an inability. Sorry, it's not an inability. It's, an, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, not knowing how to connect. So it's an uncomfortableness in personal relationships. Therefore, it's easy to get lost in your work, to hide in your profession. And I'm going to call one big, big giant maybe it's not my place to say and and please push back and say it's unfair if you want to because you're here to protect the industry and, and the people that you serve but i think a lot of what i hear is is but we're serving people and the industry demands this and we have, i go yeah i get it but i don't get it and i don't buy it because i think at the end of the day you still have choice you still can create a business you can still create a practice that is built around your lifestyle and I don't buy that you have to do it the way it's been done historically, because I don't think it's working for the very reasons that you outlined at the, at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I'm not going to defend it because I agree with you. It is the way it is. I try to be different, but you know, it's hard to be different. It's really hard to be different. There's a, there's really there's a, there's a societal, I'll, I'll explain my scenario. So I, um, I'm going to give all the excuses, but my, I was a child of the 80s. My dad was a doctor. My mom was a doctor, but more of the primary care. But dad worked hard. He, I never felt neglected, but certainly we didn't have him at the, at the rugby games and because he was a doctor, he was at work. Um, and I generally, gen, I, I generally can say no resentment at all. I feel sorry for him that for what he missed out on. Not mm. so much that I missed out so I'm on that camp where you say you're trying to be the opposite. Not not in every aspect. I, again, never felt neglected or unloved or unworthy or anything, but I, I want to be there. So I, I've tried to shape my career in every possible way to not to be present. But then you do it and you feel guilty. You feel judged. People are like, I, I sometimes feel like I have the opposite problem in the kind to selfness where I feel like I'm not being too soft on myself. You know, am I reaching my full potential by being a slacker because I'm, you know, it's 11 o'clock on a weekday morning and I'm watching my kids do something. And I know, I know, I know, I know, my, I know cerebrally and I know in my heart that that's the right decision. Yeah. But there's that little, little big fucking cultural voice and, and, and in our profession, again, there's an expectation of, you know, there's almost a stigma to the world, to the word, and luckily that's changing, but part-time vet. Oh, he's just a yeah. part, just a part-time vet. He's just not a real vet. <laughs> and can I, can I just be excused for one second? This door is banging. Of and course. I don't know if you're picking it up in the audience. No, not at all. Excuse me. I'm just getting my cool shorts away. I, I was looking um, at those. These are very cool. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're great. And I've got the, the little, the little weird toe socks. Talk about being different. <laughs> Every time I take those off, people go, what the hell are you wearing? <laughs> Um, apologies about that, but no. but I but I get that he's you know he just a part time vet. Uh -huh. You know when you ask, I often see this with women. You know what do you do? I'm just a mum. Mm -hmm. That word "just" is is such an undermining, such an undermining word. And I and again, I commend you for for being different in a community that ne doesn't necessarily share or encourage that type of differentness. But it it is coming regardless, and I think it takes people like yourself to challenge the status quo. But 
I'm also imagining, and I, I could be off here, but the judgment maybe within the industry also comes from the fact that when you do something, you're inviting people to consider how they're doing it. So, you know, the, the, the couple that go to the dinner party and, and announce to their friends that they're going to homeschool their kids and all the other couples, if this happens, the other couples jump on them and go, oh, well, they're going to be inadequate from a social standpoint and they, they're going to become recluses and this and that. Some of that might be genuine concern, but it's also, if I don't attack this, I either have to reflect upon this as it relates to me being a parent and am I doing the right thing by putting my kids in an institution that I may or may not even agree with. But if I attack it, that's the best form of kind of, I suppose, defense to some extent. Um, But it's interesting. It's just something for maybe for you to reflect upon or anybody else to reflect upon, uh, you know, a couple of things. And we don't have to genuinely discuss this at all, but my dad was busy. He was a doctor. And I do feel the way you said it, but also within society, that there are certain professions that it's okay to be super busy because he was X. Mm-hmm. My dad's a vet, so he was busy. Yeah. And that's where it comes back to this idea of choice for your listeners now and in the future is that there's not just an expectation that you should be happy and you should be lucky. You should be appreciative of what you've, you know, you've got, but you should also work to the bone doing it and you should sacrifice so much. And I don't think that's written on billboards. I don't think it's written in contracts. I don't think it's on sexy neon lights outside of practices or on the streets that I've ever seen. I don't even think the universe has sent a a, a WhatsApp message around it, but I think it's a kind of an inbuilt expectation that you're only doing it well. If at the end of the week, there is nothing left for you or anybody else to get. And that to me is wrong. And then people say, oh, hang on a second. I play 18 holes of golf every Friday. And I go, cool, brilliant. And how many of those 18 holes of golf do you think or feel guilty about not being in the office? Looking after Peggy's Pomeranian and Sue's strange cat from China or wherever the hell these different breeds are from obviously i'm not a vet i've just been exposed but well actually i do think about that a lot well you might as well be in the practice because the 18 holes of golf are doing you no good all they're doing is invoking more guilt Mm. yeah and i don't know i don't know what's the solution to that because i say these things i try and i try and be different but now i've started this podcast thing I've, I've, i've now i'm actually more engaged in what i'm doing i'm enjoying it more so i'm less present when i'm present Mm. I'm less exactly that guilt thing of yeah yeah I'm I'm gonna go for a walk with you, but I really feel like I should be editing my podcast. Yeah, yeah. That's I don't know how do you what, how, is that just a mindfulness thing? Well, I, th- I what I'd love to do is I love to understand the origin of that. Like what what, what what's the actual origin of that? And and I think in 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 your case, I would respectfully say that. There is some things you've picked up in, in, in within the profession you're in, within the veterinary industry, et cetera. But there's definitely some fundamental cultural expectations, not by what your dad said, but just by who he was. And it's not negative. It's not to try to turn your dad into a villain. And often people say, well, what happens if I do discover that I wasn't, I, I, you know, you said, well, I don't feel neglected or feel anger or whatever. But what happens if we, we, we do d- a deeper dive on it? And there is anger and there is resentment and there is sadness and there is frustration. People go, well, that'll just piss me off, and make me feel more of a void between myself and my dad. No, it's the actual opposite, because whatever you feel towards somebody, it's playing out. You can't help but allow however you feel emotionally about somebody to naturally play out every moment of every day by not letting them see the grandkids or not calling over as much or whatever it happens to be. It always plays out. What I'm asking people to do is to be aware of actually what happened, what's happening, so you can begin to repair it, even if it's a one, one-way dialogue, even if it's just you doing the internal work. Sometimes it requires a conversation with the other person. There's many people who have parents, and we, you know, we love this idea of a one last letter this may or may not be useful to you or any of your listeners, but I love the, the, the one last idea is just simply a frame to try to create, not urgency is always the wrong word, but a sense of, let's just use urgency. And one of the most powerful exercises that I think any human can do is to write a one last letter to their parents. 
And the first letter is one of anger and frustration and judgment and negativity and everything else, even though they don't think they have it. And the letter will, will shock you often. I know I'm not angry. My dad wasn't at my rugby games. And before you know it, you're writing a letter and you're going, you, whatever, X, Y, and Z, you should have been whatever. I'm not saying that'll happen. I don't know, but I'm saying that it, it often does. You write the first letter and you, 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 the, the agreement is you write that letter, you never reread it and you put it in the garbage, you burn it, you just get rid of it. And it's a form of letting go, purging a little bit. And then the second letter is a letter that you might contemplate actually handing to your father and or your mother. And I suggest that exercise for you, but I'd also suggest it for your listeners because it's a way of relinquishing the, 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 the tentacles of the past and how they've influenced who you think you are right now. I suppose that's the best way. And don't ask me to repeat that because I've never said that before. But to begin to release and relinquish this expectation so you can begin to own who you are now and build or rebuild Sometimes it's not about getting out of the veterinary practice. It's not about becoming a baker. It's not about becoming a, a, a surf uh, instructor. It's not about necessarily abandoning the business. I think we, when we get to that point, we've left it too late. We, we, we've exhausted ourselves to the point where we just can't contemplate another 10 years in this industry. I think if we're proactive in the process earlier on, I think we can, we can avoid a lot of the disconnectedness. And I think the, the, the biggest piece of disconnectedness and lostness is when someone literally takes their own life because they're at such a place in their life that they feel that I believe often suicide is about believing the world will be a better place without you. It's not actually the most selfish act. And I, and I learned that from a gentleman called Professor Anthony Clare, one of the greatest psychiatrists that has ever lived. And I was very fortunate to travel around the world with him in Australia a number of times, et cetera. And uh, he, he taught me about that, but that's the ultimate disconnectedness. That's the ultimate form of loss. But imagine if we had had a conversation with those people 10 years earlier or 15 years earlier, or God forbid, we actually bring it into the industry, into the curriculum, into the school and have that conversation. And there's, there's one thing I want to share because when I worked with the U S military in, in, in the U S I was brought in a different uh, military bases and, you know, I'm, I'm not an advocate of war or the military for that matter, but I love people. And I wasn't going to just discriminate between, you know, somebody with a uniform on versus somebody not. Um, and one of the things that became very apparent very quickly is there's 22 military personnel a day in the United States committing suicide after they leave, um, they leave the forces, 22 a day. That does not account for alcoholism, drug abuse, addiction, depression, whatever, 22 military a day committing suicide. And I remember being at a, a very, fairly high level meeting in the Pentagon, one of these massive, like something out of a movie, one of these massive boardroom tables, a general sitting uh, right next to me at the top of the table with all his bells and whistles. And they talked about this military problem of uh, suicide and everything else. And, and I said, with respect to the general, I said, it's not a, mil a military problem, it's a human problem of identity that when the mother, you know, is still the primary caregiver, as he said, or the father, but let's just say the mother says goodbye to their 18 year old as they walk down the drive, get in the Uber and go to college. They close the door, look in the mirror and go, if they still recognize their face, their own face I'm talking about, they go, what's next now? Who, who, who are you now? Now that your son or your daughter or sons and daughters have left the building and that's been your identity for so long, and I feel that the reason it's so massively catastrophic for the military is because they're treated like heroes in society in America. When you meet a, a man or a woman with a military uniform, they're often bought coffee in the line in Starbucks. They're often given up their, you know, offered a seat in first class when they walk onto a plane. I'm not saying we shouldn't respect people who are making the world safer, better, or whatever. I'm not saying we shouldn't respect people. But not one of the men and women that I ever met and interviewed said, I love being praised for pulling a trigger and taking another man or woman's life, regardless of the situation. They don't feel deserving. They don't want it. Not one of them. Not one of them wanted it. And I think vets have been given a, ped a natural place of a pedestal in society. And I think it's detrimental because that pedestal isn't necessarily a place of healthiness and respect. It's a pedestal of expectations. 
probably like that better still, Philip. <laughs> yeah, you do, but it comes with a cost. I'm just saying, just be aware of the shadow side of it. Mm. Because when those men and women take their uniform off, they haven't just they haven't just stepped away from the military. They've literally lost their uniform, their identity. And when they put it in the closet or it's taken back or they burn it or whatever it happen, happens to be. But interestingly enough, you go way back to the beginning. If you ask many of the men and women in the service today, why did you join the military? I mean, I think this is fascinating. And this goes back to our point is who do you play for? Who do you, who do you practice for? They joined because of 9-11 anger, not the most authentic response in the world. They joined to follow in their parents' footsteps. Again, not the most authentic representation in the world. They joined because they didn't know what else to do. Not the most authentic represent, representation in the world. Or they joined because the military gives them access to healthcare and different levels of, 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 of financial aid and everything else that no other industry would do. All of those, those four are, they're not sustainable. Or you might meet someone who did it because they really wanted to do it. And I only met one doesn't mean he needs to leave or they really need to leave they just need to reimagine the relationship to what they do I'm trying to draw a parallel to the vet profession so the most common answer to that question is why do you do it is it is people will say I've always been I've always a lot of people have always known i was going to do it I've always had a thing for animals i want to work with animals i want to help animals oh, it sounds like a valid reason to me it's a, it's a good reason right it is, it is a valid reason is, but it's like, you know, I love dancing. So should I make a career out of dancing? I, I don't, I, I'm not questioning the validity okay. of the rationale behind it. Um, but sometimes that's, that's, I suppose my question is, and it's a very, very scary question because it, 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 it could come across as being really judgmental is, is how true is that statement? Like how many statements do we make as human beings that if we're truly questioning them, I think the thing that I, I'm known for is, is really challenging people to a very deep place so we can uncover the truth so they can rebuild from there. Not many of us have that. Like how many people have actually been really challenged about that narrative, that story? It may turn out to be absolutely true and therefore absolutely brilliant and they're absolutely aligned. But if they're burning out, if they're not fully satisfied, well, then the origin of that story has to be flawed. There has to be something missing. I thought we were going to get strategies on how to be kind to yourself, Philip. <laughs> tips, tips and tricks, but this is so much better. So it's not, it's not just going for a massage and uh, cocktails. But, but let, me, let me address that by, by saying this. Somebody rings me and they're a little bit stereotypical, a little bit you know, obvious, but let's just say they're, they're, their wife sends them or their husband says, let's just use a wife situation. A wife rings me and says, my husband John's an alcoholic and he has to talk to you. And John comes on the phone begrudgingly. So, so tell me about yourself, John. Well, my wife thinks I'm an alcoholic, but listen, let's, what we, let's, let's do this. Come on, get it over and done with. How many sessions do I have to talk to you? And let's hope I don't have to open up about my childhood and whatever. And I go, John, are you an alcoholic? Well, I, I, I could stop drinking tomorrow morning. So well, great, okay. So then do I take out the day? So in other words, what I'm saying is, unless John admits he's an alcoholic, there's nothing you can do. Like absolutely nothing. You can strategize all day long. I think if nothing else comes out of this conversation other than people in the industry saying, maybe I'm not kind to myself. If they, if they, if that, they're smart enough to figure out the solutions. They're smart enough to know anybody in the world. If you give them a blank piece of paper and says, write down the three things you should not be eating for your energy or for your health or for your weight, they'll write down sugar, alcohol, whatever it is. The, you know, we all have our three or five or 10 or 15. We don't need more strategies necessarily in our personal lives, maybe in our businesses, there's always updates and everything else. I think if they become aware of the harshness and the lack of kindness, the presence of that, the, 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 the presence of that in their lives, become aware of the next step of this. Well, what's the cost of that? Because often we say, yeah, I'm harsh. Yeah, I'm pushy. Yeah, but, the, but, but here's all the 10 reasons it's epic. And everyone tells me they want to be like me, in fact. And, and, and I've just been on a podcast last week about how I'm so driven. What's the problem with that? Well, go great. Well, you know, do your kids feel supported? Are you, or no matter what they do, is it's never enough. 
you know, what about your wife? And I go, well, my wife's very happy. And I go, well, is it okay if I phone her and ask her? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I need to, in other words, I'd phone her and ask her, he says, he's an asshole. I love him to bits. He's brilliant or her, but no matter what I do, it's never enough. It's insane. It's exhausting. I can't, it's never enough. So to be aware of the presence of this, of this thing or the absence of kindness, the cost it has in your life, that's the piece that we tend not to look at. And then out of that comes the answer. It's like, that's easy. How do I, how do I become more gentle? How do I work on this? Do I need some therapy? Do I need to go on a retreat? Do I need to look at my past? Do I need to look at the, the way in which I hold myself in the world? How can I soften a little bit? How can I be a better person? So I don't put all this weight and energy and expectation on others. Man, that's good. I'm going to have to, it's been an hour. I can't use all of your time, but I, I want to, it's so good. Oh, well, I, I, I love your energy. And, I, and, and again, I really, I'm just, I just hope I've, uh, we have articulated, I've got this point across because I, I would imagine there'll be quite a lot of maybe even resistance to this conversation, or yeah. maybe there won't be, maybe it's time. No, I don't know. The profession's open to the conversation. That's why I do it because we're talking about it, but yeah. we don't have answers and, and we want to talk about it, but there's also the hangover of exactly the stuff we talked about. But it's changing. Yeah. We're, we're growing. We're getting there. Um, there's more and more people who are going, you know, fuck this. I, that's not going to be me. Yeah. Um, the, I suppose that, you know, as we begin maybe to wrap up, but I, mean, I, I got a, an email yesterday from somebody out of the blue. It was actually a, a LinkedIn comment, but I I'd never, almost never check it. So maybe it's three months old. I don't know. But it's so funny that this gentleman said, I, I want to talk to you about doing an event or doing something with our team around vulnerability in the workplace. And I called my wife in and I, and I not just read his, 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 his ask to me, but I, I actually read my, my reply. And we created this thing called team deepening and it doesn't matter about the details, but team deepening is moving on from this idea of team building. Like, you know, the, the you know, let's go potholing, let's go bungee jumping. That's, I'm not saying any of those things are bad. It's just like, we're looking for something deeper because most of us our, our ent- most of our awake hours are in a in a working environment and we're looking for that culture right or wrong to sustain us and the stats and the history not the, the history the stats and the science show that the number one thing we're looking for in, in a work community is connection not just with the people we work with and the people we serve but within ourselves we're, we're yearning connection and if anything this pandemic has shown us is that that's accelerated that that need and and I, and I made it just a really honest comment to my wife is I think for years, I've been trying to flaff around the conversation, trying to manipulate the language to, 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 to not to sound too fluffy, not, not to be judged because I want to fit in. I want to be liked. I want to whatever, like every other human being in the world. And I wrote back, this guy might run a million miles. I wrote back and said, there is no better way to connect with another human being other than vulnerability. In fact, every relationship on earth that has ever authentically deepened it's found it, it's found it's founded in genuine vulnerability not fake vulnerability to achieve something anyway i just found myself writing this little piece kind of unapologetically but there's two things i want to say about that one is i think the world is is really shifting the fact that we're even having this conversation tells you that and the second thing is there is an absence and i say absence of vulnerability within the veterinary community yeah, And maybe absence might sound extreme. I, I don't think so, but there's an absence in certain quarters. It's an industry that feels it has to, has the, has to have the answers for obvious reasons, because we're talking life and death here. We're, we're talking about not making mistakes, all those things you cited at the beginning. But I think if I could ask, ask gently and respectfully ask your, your, your listeners in the future is to... Find the, find the place to be courageous, to allow people to see a little bit more of your weakness because you have them. And if you save 45 dogs this week and seven cats next week and 84 goldfish the week after, it's never going to make up for it. You have your inadequacies, you have your insecurities, you have those moments. I'm not asking you to blast it all over the world. I'm not asking you to put it in neon lights. I'm not asking you to email it to your clients. Test it with a couple of people. Allow people in. Vets are often, there's a shield. 
And it's a shield of protectiveness. It's also a shield of insecurity and scaredness. Because the reason people are taking their lives, the reason they're burning out is because they're not connecting enough with themselves and with people around them. And vulnerability is one magnificent way to allow people in. You see vulnerability every day. You stand in front of owners holding their dogs as they pass away. You, you break news of cancer and tumors that are non-operable and, and, and every single moment of every day, or not every single moment, but many times a week and all, often. And you see the tears, you see the breakdowns, you see people you've worked with for five or six years. You might've even become attached to the animal yourself. What's the outlet? Where do you, where do you release? Very good question. And I tell you everything we've talked about today. If just people could do that, just that piece, I promise you, I, 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 I guarantee you, and I predict that many of the stats that you cited at the beginning of this call will reduce. That is the most important thing I think you and I have discussed in, the, in this entire call, in my opinion. So is that just, I'm trying to think, for, because you're right, there's that shield for, for many reasons. You, you've got to keep your shit together. You're on shift. So I do, I do emergency vetting, but it's the same, everything. As you say, there's that, the situations that create strong emotions, but you have to silo it because you, because two minutes later, I'm next door at the next consult and it's the people mm -hmm. with their brand new puppy. So how do you, how do you express that vulnerability? What does it look like? Is it with well, each other? So is, it, is it with the people in your team? Because you don't. <laughs> And this classic was exactly what you're saying. You don't want to look weak. You don't want to be the blubbering vet out the back. What? No, I, I think I, I, but I think you've you've nailed it with one word. Have to, or two words. I have to. I have. No, you don't have to. The first person I, I ran a retreat in Ireland. I run these little retreats in the west coast of Ireland, and I ran my first retreat in what felt like a lifetime. And the great thing for me is I realized why I'm on this earth you know, a number of years ago. And I was compounded again last October when we had our first group of people in years. It's like two and a half years since we ran a live event. And not, sometimes, not always, emotion comes up. People cry, they get in touch with stuff. I don't make people cry despite the rumors. <laughs> people cry because they're meant to cry. People cry because a conversation happens that touches them or whatever it happens to be. We walked into the room and uh, everyone was settling down. We're just having a cup of tea just to gather. And somebody says, so what's it like, you know, standing in the room after two and a half years or whatever? I just broke down. It's the beginning of the retreat that I'm the facilitator. I'm the guy that's meant to have his shit together. And now my narrative would have been four or five years ago. I have to keep my shit together. I have to do that. I have to, have to, have to. I, I broke down and I didn't like fall on the ground. They didn't have to pick me up necessarily, but I shed a good old tear because I, and I didn't realize it was going to come. I wasn't expecting it, but I was really proud that I didn't stop it. All I can tell you is this. I'm not asking your listeners to walk from one cubicle or one operating room into a, a consultation room, bawling their eyes out as a representation of courage and bravery and arrival as it comes to this relationship with vulnerability. All I can tell you is from a, let's just call it a consumer standpoint. If I brought the cat I cherish, the dog I cherish, the animal I love to a practice, and the first thing I met, or, or after maybe many consultations, and I met a vet walking through the door with tears rolling down their eyes, and they just looked at me and said, listen, sorry about that, but they don't even have to say sorry, but you know, just we just lost an animal next door. I just go where where, where do I where do I sign up? <laughs> where, where, like, can I just sign a contract now? Because you're the human, not not the not not, not the, the the part. You're the man. You're the woman. You're the human that I want to look after my dog. You're the spirit, the the energy that I want to be around. I'm not asking them to go around in bumbling messes, crying left, right, and center, and having boxes of Kleenex everywhere. But I don't want you to walk away thinking you have to be something when you don't. I came alive as a speaker. I'm not saying I'm good, bad, or indifferent. That's up to other people. I came alive when I stopped trying to control my emotions on stage. 
when I stopped trying to, I didn't walk in here today saying, big sign, don't cry. I was, I think I teared up, you know, telling a story or two. I don't, I have no shame. I have no judgment for that. I used to. That's me. All in. Everything you get. Good, bad, or indifferent, you decide. But that's me, and I'm not going to change for anybody. But yet, as a speaker, you don't cry. As a facilitator, on day one, when everyone else is coming, you've got to show you. And you know what, people? I guarantee if we had a way of measuring it, I bet you that room was a better place because I was the first person to cry. Guarantee it. Oh, we're going to have to do more of these. You know that. We, people are the, that my profession's going to listen to this and go, we need more Philip. <laughs> well, I'm here. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> we're building a castle or restoring a castle and we're doing some good work, hopefully. And I'm here and I'm here to serve. And that's, I've known that for a long time. So I, I'm up for that anytime in the future. How is it? How does it sound to have a Redvelt podcast listeners event in Ireland with Philip for a week or so? Well, you come, I'll provide the castle. I'll provide the conversation and you guys get over here we'll put on something really special because uh, my specialty is small live intimate gatherings where we have deep meaningful conversations that literally will help you change your own life we don't change your life we we help people change their own life and that's uh, if people are up for that you know where i am sign me up man philip thank you so much for your, your generous generous time and and Rave, all the, all the love that you bring to it. That's really fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, well, you, you know what? My work is only as good as the people that come and, and my conversations on podcasts are only as good as the hosts and you are exceptional and you are so courageous. And I, and I, if you go back to any podcast I've ever done, I rarely ever say that. So um, I've really enjoyed you today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Recording stopped. Well, the-